Speaking of the Wilsey Asset Management Team, we have uh, Chase Wilsey here, our, our millennial investment expert. Chase, good to have you, buddy. How are you? So, um, okay, so I have to ask you, because um, I don't think, I, it, we should probably reset your history here. Okay. So you are how old again? 23. 23 years old, and you are what, a Series 7? Series 65. Series 65. Now, what does that mean? That means I'm a fiduciary. I can, you know, manage money for people. I can't sell you any products. Can't sell you an annuity. Can't sell you life insurance. But you can move the, the you can move the pieces around the chessboard a little All, bit. Exactly. All I can do is say, manage the money. Say this is where we should be investing the money okay. for long term. And then, growth. but you're, but then you're studying for your next test, right? Uh, well, I'm I'm studying right now to get my MBA, and then after that, the plan is to go for the CFA. So CFA, that's a certified financial analyst, yeah, right? Charter financial analyst. Charter financial. And what does that what does that do? It just kind of gives you more credibility when it comes to analyzing companies. Mm -hmm. Again, kind of geeking out on those 10 Qs, 10 Ks, yeah. really understanding what you're analyzing. Now, what is my? Here's my question for you: What is the difference between a Series Six, a Series Seven? A series, what'd you call it? 65. 65. What, what are the differences between that? Those are licenses, right? Yes, those are licenses. So Series 7 actually enables you to sell products. Stocks, bonds, mutual funds, annuities. Whatever it may be. And then again, 65 uh, gives you that fiduciary title where I can't sell any products, but I have to always act in the client's best interest. That's kind of an important topic to understand as well. Series 7, you're not held to a fiduciary responsibility. You're actually, that's what you do if you're a broker. And you're held to a suitability requirement, which means you can sell the worst performing mutual fund, if highest it, commission charges. If it charges, suits the investor. As long as it suits the so investor. So if you've got some cowboy that wants to take risk, you can sell him anything. You, know, you can sell him a stock that's 0. .00001 cents a share, and you say this is going to be the next high flyer. Uh, they've got a they've got a hydroponic business or something, right? I mean, <laughs> that's sort of because a, a stock broker doesn't have any responsibility. It's the brokerage firm that's looking over him. It exactly. has responsibility to determining what stocks are going to sell to a certain client, right? Yeah, yeah. And I mean, so it's such an important thing to look at if you're going out and investing. Understand if they're held to a suitability requirement or the fiduciary standard. Um, I mean, us, for example, we went through an SEC audit last year. The SEC now, what does was, that mean? So the SEC, the Securities Exchange Commission, mm -hmm. you know, the law of the land when it yeah. comes to security analysis, uh, came into our office for six months and went through everything mm -hmm. to make sure we're upholding that fiduciary requirement. Mm -hmm. So that was a big thing for our company and really sets us apart from a lot of other competitors. That, that, and that's a good thing and a bad thing for some companies. For you guys, it was a good thing because you had, because it was like, yeah, come come, look up our source with a flashlight because it's only going to give us credibility at the end of the day. Exactly. Right? Are all firms audited by the SEC at some point or is it just like an IRS random type thing? I, I think it's just an IRS random type thing. I haven't heard of any other firms that have gone through an mm -hmm. SEC audit. It's just the luck um, of the draw. They're just, it's, it's, a, it's a random pick just to make sure people are doing what they say they're supposed to be doing. Exactly. And I, I mean, we were very fortunate. We walked away with two slaps on the wrist, I'll call it. Uh, one, I was still in school at NAU and um, I was listed on the website as being with the firm. I was doing part-time work, doing analysis for the firm. But they the gave SEC you a hard time like because that. you weren't actually full-time with the firm. Exactly. So wow. the, we had to change the website. That's kind of silly. <laughs> that, that, and that you call that a slap of the wrist? I would not call that a slap of the wrist. Okay. Yeah. okay. And we we'll walked away with no fines. So that, wow. that's, the, that's the big thing there. Well, I think you know, anybody going through an SEC audit would be, that, if, you, if you are still in business after an SEC audit, you're obviously doing something right. <laughs> hey, we were on, we were, uh, you and your dad, Brent Wilsey, who runs Wilsey Asset Management, uh, was in studio on Friday. Was it Friday? I think it was Friday. It was Friday. Uh, we never got to, we were going to talk about Mattel. Yes. Toy manufacturers. What, you are hot on this company. MAT, is that the stock symbol? MAT, not hot on the company. You're I, not hot on the company. Not okay. hot on the company. But I know you want to talk about it. Talk to us about it. Why, why, what, what's, what's, the, what's the big deal? Well, I think Mattel is an interesting company for a lot of us millennials because, you know, we grew up with Hot Wheels. The girls grew mm -hmm. up with Barbie dolls. They do a lot of the Disney classic toys. So yeah. they really hit the hot topics for us millennials when we were growing up. Um, but looking at the balance sheet, because as you know, that's what we like to look at. Mm -hmm. There are some major concerns. Uh, debt to equity right now is about 93%. That, that's an okay number. If it hits 100, that's when I became, become to get a little worried. So 93% is okay. Uh, they do pay a very nice dividend of about 4.5%. While that sounds attractive, the mm -hmm. thing that really concerns me is their dividend payout ratio is 150%. Okay, now talk about your dividend pay, payout ratio because I think a lot of people need to understand. That's a really yeah. important number. So the dividend payout ratio is how much of their earnings the company uses to pay out that dividend. 
So that means Mattel is taking 150% of their earnings over the last 12 months to pay off that 4.5% dividend. Mm -hmm. Now, what, why that should be worrisome is because you should be saying, how is that sustainable going forward? Mm -hmm. This company is not taking any of their earnings and reinvesting in the business. Rather, they're, they're giving it all out to the they're dividend. They're just giving it all away. Yes. Is it, so basically what they're basically trying to do is, is get people to buy their stock, right? Most likely. Which is, which is a false sort of prop up with respect to... I mean, if you wanted to support your stock, it'd be better to do good earnings numbers and, do, and good press releases, right? Exactly. Versus rewarding people for buying your stock because then they're just buying your stock for the sake of the reward, not because it's a good company. Yeah, and what could happen is that they're not growing those earnings over time and they just stay stable from here on out. That dividend then will become worthless because if the stock drops 4.5%, well, then you're at break even from uh, taking that dividend and the loss in the stock price. Yeah, the uh, the interesting part uh, about uh, about dividends is that I think people get blinded by them. Oh, absolutely! It's not a reason to buy a stock. No, it's a it's it's a, it's a sidecar. His name's Chase Wilsey, Wilsey Asset Management. We got more to come. Big Biz Show, BigBizShow.com. Stand by. This is the Big Biz Show, the money talk show with less bang for your buck. Here, Rusty Nails and Sully. Rest ever coming back from uh, summer vacation. Labor Day is over. Ninety percent sure most schools are back. Well, both my girls are back. One more semester of college I have to pay for, and then I can start saving for retirement again. Oh my gosh! <laughs> you guys ever talk about that? Chase, Chase Wilson's with us. We'll see how that ends. You know, you guys are balancing whether I can only afford uh, saving for college. I remember back when, you know, when uh, you know, I was in my 30s, you yeah. know, when we first had the girls. You know, at that point, you're like, okay, I can only, I can't afford to save for both. Yeah. I can only do college or retirement. You ever get to get into that quandary with your clients? Uh, sometimes. I mean, kind of one of the things I recommend doing, because a lot of kids too freak out about paying off their student debt. And, yeah. you know, my, my philosophy is if you may have a 4% interest rate and you can make 8% in the market, hey, you're net positive 4% there. Yeah, I mean, um, student loan rates are dirt cheap. Exactly. I mean, you know, we didn't take out any student loans, but I kind of wish I had because they were at 2-3% for a while there. Yeah. That's free money, basically. Oh, yeah. I mean, why would you put your own money out when you can borrow it at that rate, right? Exactly. I mean, I'm, I actually pulled out a student loan because I am paying for my grad school. Uh -huh. And, um, you know, it's about 4.5%. You know, yeah. you'll, make, you'll make eight on your money. You'll end, up, you'll end up doing better at the end of the day. Exactly. Using Split, their money. Focus looking towards the long run. What I recommend to people, too, is saying, you know, kind of establish how much money you want to save uh, for retirement per month. Typically, we tell people 10 15%. So if you have to pay down student debt as a part of that, understand how much that student debt is and still look at saving for retirement at 10 to 15 percent. Whatever isn't used to pay down the minimum payment on your student debt, that's what should go to retirement savings or just, you know, a brokerage account. You know, talk about um, we talked about this before and I want to talk to you about it again is, is in that that's with your philosophy on buying a house. Mm -hmm. So you are a millennial. Millennials are not interested in buying homes anymore. No. Our, in our in our generation, it was. Get a degree, get a job, buy get married, buy a house, have a family. Yeah, you don't. You're not interested in that. Not at the time. No. Um, kind of my goal in life is to only buy one house. Okay. So, once I get married and have you know a kid or two, hopefully that's the dream. Then I'll look at buying a house. Uh, no. Why, now why not? Because I mean, it's it's you know people think of a house as a re as as you know that's that's what I'm going to retire on the equity in my house. Talk about that. <clears throat> well, reason being, I'd I'd rather invest in stocks. Okay. So I'd rather. So what do you say, what, what do you say to those people? Who say, oh, man, that's too risky. I mean, I, a home is a, you know it's something I can, you know, it's tangible. It's not going anywhere. The real estate market's never gone down in the, in the history of the world. Real estate's always worth more. I, I you can yeah. say the same about stocks. What do you say to those people? <laughs> well, I say you look at the long term, and stocks have far outperformed real estate. Okay. So what are the numbers on that? Uh, going back over the past twenty years, uh, the price of the S and P five hundred has appreciated on average nine point nine percent. Well, on average, on average, see, that's what people don't understand. It's, you know, when you guys do illustrations and I want to mm -hmm. talk about this just for a second. So when you go to your financial planner, he's not going to give you a pie in the sky and say, oh, you're going to make 20 percent of your money. But he will probably say 8 percent, which yeah. is a reasonable expectation, because truthfully, you're going to earn between 7 and 11 percent more than likely over the course of your lifetime. That's yeah. kind of where it kind of falls in. If you do the right investment, if you do the right investment, <laughs> 8 percent is pretty damn conservative. Yeah, it, it is. I mean, because the S&P, the S&P is at 10. Mm -hmm. Let's face it. 
Yeah. So what is what's the average real estate return across the country? Three point two percent. Okay. On average per year over the okay. same time period. And a lot of people forget, you know, you bought a home back in two thousand six. Right. You're probably still have negative equity in the home. Sure. Whereas if you bought the S and P mm-hmm. back in two thousand six, well, you're positive. Yeah. So the the idea of having this tangible asset mm-hmm. really alleviates a lot of stress for people, I think. Mm-hmm. But I mean, for me, I look at the stock and I say, it's a small piece of a large business. That's the yeah. way we look at stocks. And I say, geez, I own a piece of Apple. Like that is awesome. That doesn't scare me at all when the market dips. When Apple pulls back, I mm-hmm. understand why it pulls back. Right. So I, I, it's a tangible piece to me as well. You know, when I look at my iPhone, there's a tangible piece of what I own. Yeah, so right. that's kind of the way we look at stocks to alleviate some of the stress. What about cars? Do you believe in car loans? Do you believe in, in cause I, I purchased my cars outright forever and ever and ever and I realized what am I doing yeah. because interest rates on car loans are, are still I mean I at least break even on investing the money yeah right <laughs> I mean talk about that so uh well personally I do kind of have a car problem I'll call it one of my worst financial decisions I guess is when it comes to cars same thing with my dad we're, we're, we're terrible you guys are people. just car guys okay as I am too and my dad is yeah. too. I understand it's it's yeah it's my only vice other than other than uh Chris and Curtis over there. But other than that, uh, I understand that. So the problem is, is you don't make smart decisions because you have to have that car. Well, I, I just get car antsy, you know? So when, after I have a car for two years, I need a new one. So this is why you have to get it <laughs> investing to make up for the stupid decision you're about to make on the car, right? <laughs> it's unfortunate. But so what I do is I actually lease my cars. So, what, I, so, so what's the advantage of leasing versus purchasing? So Talk leasing, you're, you're not building any equity in the car, so mm-hmm. to speak. But once the three years is up, you can just turn the car back in. Right. You're done. It's good to go. Uh, with buying the car, you can actually build equity in the car, then sell it. However, if you buy a new car, two years down the road, you try and sell it, you're probably going to have negative equity in it. So that's why I look at leasing the cars. But you know, when it comes to buying a car, the best piece of financial advice right. I can give if you are going to buy a car and hold it for 10 years, let's say, uh, is actually shop for the loan before you shop for the car. Reason being... Shop for the loan before you shop for the car. Okay. Exactly. So right. you, you shop for, you know go to your credit union, try and understand, you know, what's my rate going to be. So that way, when you go in and you buy a car, you know, you pick that one out and the, I'll tell you, buying the car is a much more exciting part. Shopping for the loan is not too fun, but you, you know, it's important because you can shop save for the you, loan first. Yeah. It can save you a ton of money on interest because when you go in and you say, you know, get down to the numbers and say, okay, I'll buy the car for $30,000. I have a loan established through my credit union uh-huh. of let's say 2%. Okay. And that's even pretty high right now. Uh, can you guys beat that as a car dealership? So it kind of gives oh, you a leg okay. up. So, when you, it comes so, to you have, so you walk in the door with some leverage right there. Like yeah. That, right? So, I mean, that can save you a lot of money on interest right. over the life of the loan. So, important piece of advice. Okay. There. Last of all, before I let you out of here today, one of our biggest uh, sponsors is Blumen Brands. They're a publicly traded company, BLMN. They own Outback Steakhouse, they own Cheeseburger in Paradise, they own Fleming Steakhouse. Uh, restaurants for millennials versus restaurants for baby boomers. It's a whole different story because people aren't going to restaurants as much as they used to, right? Correct. Yeah, actually, restaurant traffic is down about 30% since 2007. Uh, reason being, in my opinion, is we've seen a you know growth in the millennial generation. Well, what happens is millennials and baby boomers have two different points of view when it comes to food. Okay. Baby boomers like you know the bigger portions, the good value. Mm-hmm. Where millennials are, they want everything to be organic and clean. Sure. And they'll pay up for that. And I find that interesting because the millennials have less money than the boomers, but they're willing to overpay pay, for things. Pay more. Huh? There you go. All right. We'll take a look at Bloom and Brands as a stock on Friday when you come back. Sounds like. I want you to look at it for me because technically speaking, it's a pretty good stock. All right. I want you to look at it for me. BLM. All right. Thanks, Chase. Chase Wilsey, Wilsey Asset Management. There's their website, WilseyAssetManagement.com.